On this podcast, we're tackling Iron Maiden's ninth. Thank you for joining us again for another edition. Nick Mars, the guitarist, he said, I fell out of the chair because I was so drunk. But let's delve into it a bit deeper, yeah? <laughs> Is that you quoting The Exorcist again? <laughs> yeah, and Dave must eat. <laughs> and there you go. That's the most interesting thing you're ever going to hear about Saxon. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Moshtalgia, where we relive our experiences as two young men living in a small village on the east coast of Ireland, discovering some of the greatest rock albums of all time. On this episode, Hysteria from Death Leopard, released on August 3rd, 1987 on Mercury Records, and went on to sell 25.3 million copies to date. It was the follow-up to Pyromania, which was released in 1983 and sold 12.1 million copies to date. The producer of Hysteria is Robert John Mutt Lang. His notable works include ACDC's Highway to Hell and Back in Black, Brian Adams' Waking Up the Neighbours, Shania Twain, The Woman in Me, The Chorus Blue, and also worked with the Boomtown Rats, Foreigner and Nickelback. Which one is the worst from that list? The non-alcoholic teetotaling Zambian recluse porked Shania Twain and gave her 33 Ooh. million units. Uh, she's worth it. The man has produced half a billion in album sales. That's amazing. And now, retired, he eats lettuce at the foot of the Swiss Alps. Is that how you imagine him now? As this zen-like figure, legs crossed at the bottom of the mountains, and Shania prancing around him barefoot. Yeah. A little slip on. Yeah. Oh, Mutt, play with my knobs one more time. <laughs> Of course, in Joburg, you know, it's really good if you have Shania, you marry her, and then you give her lots of music, and she makes lots of money for you and me. Everything was really good, you know. But Shania, she was half Indian, wasn't she? Half Indian, and then full of a half South African. (laughs) 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 Flat stomach, wandering around in the desert. That don't impress me much. Leopard skin pants, tongue for cars. Oh, that impresses me a lot. Her confirmed ancestry includes English, French and Irish, would you believe? Shania's maternal grandmother was Eileen Pierce from Newbridge. I don't know where I got the native Indian stuff. Jerry Twain, an Ojibwe Indian, was her father. Anyway, that's for the Shania show on um, The Woman in Me. I think there's a woman in me sometimes as well. I have to talk about facts every single week. It's a fact. It is a fact. Hysteria. Facts. It's Def Leppard's most successful album to date. Got to number one on both the UK album chart and the US album chart. Fact. Spando Ballet, of all people, were their drinking buddies for the album's writing sessions. Fact. These writing sessions for the album were in a house in Dunleary in Dublin, where they were living as tax exiles. Why were they living as tax exiles, Michael? I'm glad you asked me that, Adrian. After the enormous success of their third album, Pyromania, in 1983, they quickly found out that if you stayed beyond 62 days a year in the UK, you'd have to pay more than 80% of your earnings to the taxman. Hence, they relocated to Dublin, Ireland, which didn't have this and had more favourable tax terms for artists. That's so interesting. So if it they is made interesting. the sixty third yes. day, they would have had to hand over to Her Majesty's government a huge chunk of cash. That's right. They relocated somewhere in the Dublin mountains. Actually, we'll come to this later when we talk about the Friday Rock Show and Def Leppard's appearances on the seminal BBC One Radio Rock Show that started in 1979. Tommy Vance, the presenter, he asked them back in 1987, ahead of the release of Hysteria, when they were in Dublin in a studio, he asked them, why Dublin? And they gave not entirely truthful answers, I think. I have to talk about facts. Fact. Also, while in Dublin, they drank in a pub called the Pink Elephant. Fact. Three producers worked on the record. Jim Steinman, the band themselves. Here, you know what, Adrian, I have to go and get a beer. Talk amongst yourselves there for a Come moment. Come on, because I'm full of beans. I've had two days sleep. <laughs> All right, well, continue with your facts there and I might drop her in. Continue <laughs> with your facts there, you fact fuck. <laughs> Three producers worked on the record. Jim Steinman, the band themselves, and Mush Lang. 
I believe originally they had Mutlang on board, but Mutlang was burnt out. To a toffee uh, crisp. So at that point, they decided to hire Jim Steinman. If Mutlang hadn't been involved and it was still Jim Steinman, they would have been regulated <laughs> to the bargain basement level. I, I, I'd love to hear a Jim Steinman on, on Def Leppard. Oh, the piano. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing the but piano flurries. And, 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 and Joe Ellie going... <laughs> I imagine it didn't work. The band themselves felt that wasn't quite the sound that they were looking for. Then they tried to have a crack at it themselves, realised they couldn't do it, and get on the phone again and begged Mutlang to come in and help them. Facts. Hysteria took four years to record. This length of time added to the recording cost of Hysteria, which cost nearly $5 million. This meant they would have had to have sold 5 million copies to break even. And in the end, they sold, what, about 25 million in total. Has them coming in fifth on the biggest selling albums of 1987. Number one was, what was the biggest selling album of 1987, Adrian? 1987. What would have come out that year? It has to be Michael Jackson. It is bad. 45 million sold. Number two, the Dirty Dancing soundtrack. 32 million copies of that were sold. One of the biggest selling soundtracks of all time, (sighs) along with Saturday Night Fever, and The Bodyguard from Whitney Houston. Wow. So number three was Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses. 30 million sold so far. Number four, Faith by George Michael. 26 million. Hysteria, number five, 25 million. Number six on the biggest selling albums of 1987 was The Joshua Tree by U2, 25 million. And then finally, Whitney Houston. Whitney at number seven, 20 million units shifted. Adrian, is there a thing that kind of links them other than being the most successful albums in terms of sales? Maybe you two are the odd one out here. Yeah, sadly, I think a lot of those artists you mentioned there are no longer with us. Michael Jackson, George Michael, Whitney Houston, all gone. And also the Dirty Dancing soundtrack, the star of Dirty Dancing, Patrick Swayze, is also no longer with us. Def Leppard, they lost their guitarist, age 30. And as for you 2 they're sadly undead. That's a bit mean. If Bono died, Ireland would have a, a week of mourning. I, I don't think so. Uh, Bono isn't really liked in Ireland. Why wouldn't he be liked? The tax I avoiding, proselytizing. <laughs> tax, no one's saying nothing about him. And also speaking of Michael Jackson, his thriller album partly inspired the Hysteria album. Producer Mutt Lang's vision for the album was to make a hard rock version of Thriller. Why can't we have five or six hit singles off an album? Jai, we can do it, my friend. We can do it. We can make a big hit album. Yeah, I remember at the time it was quite unusual because albums would normally have, you know, four singles off. But then you had Hysteria, which had seven or something, and Michael Jackson's Bad, again, had seven or eight singles off. I don't think it's happened since, though. Mm, that is a question, isn't it? Mm. Although they're all singles now because uh, whatever track you stream gets into the charts. So you could release an album and all 10 songs are in the, in the top 40. God love them if they'd been around in the early 80s at the advent of the compact disc with 74 minutes running time. I mean, how would they even listen to that? They'd fall asleep after five minutes. Having a low attention span myself, one of the great things about the CD was that you could skip forward very easy. Yeah, the vinyl era would not have suited you. You're having to take the needle out and pop it back in. No. And people are going back to this. So much so that on Thoman, the, the music website, you know, they're selling cassettes again for about five euro each. Ferric oxide, type one. Blank cassettes like the ones you used to steal? I'm so very my sorry. My memory of this I'm very was sorry we were it. we would go to Dublin from our village, we would get a train directly to the city centre. And we'd, we'd take our pocket money, or, or if we'd been working, whatever, we, we'd have our wage. And we'd go to the record shops in Dublin and spend our cash. But I remember you stealing blue Agfa, Agfa blank cassettes That's right. in, in a 10-pack. Yeah. I would say my memory was hazy, but I remember you were caught, ran out of the shop, alarms blaring, security chasing you, and you were running down Grafton Street. I was walking out with a 10-pack of Agfa with no bag and no receipt, and the security guard said, do you have a receipt for those? And I said, they're in the bag. Where's the bag? It's in my pocket. Come back to the counter. And I went, yeah, sure. And as soon as he turned around, I ran out the door. By that time, also, I had my parka jacket was full of many cassette covers, and they were then jumping out of the pockets all over the cobblestones of Grafton Street as I ran away. With, but I kept the 10-pack of Agfa. Both of us were high-footing it down that street. And I remember there were cassette covers coming out of your pockets that made me laugh hysterically. And I don't... But I'm very sorry now. 
<clears throat> let me say. But you enjoyed the buzz, the adrenaline rush, the fear of getting caught. You felt alive. And I still have every one of those 10 Agva tapes that recorded the Friday rock show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so they were of use. Yeah, yeah, and that's how we can go back to the archive and talk about all of our favourite rock bands appearing on the BBC Radio 1 Friday rock show. Fact. Hysteria at one time had the working title Animal Instincts. Andy Airfix, the legendary designer behind album artwork for Metallica, Led Zeppelin, The Rolling Stones and more, was tasked with creating the album artwork. Originally, he'd envisioned that the artwork would have an eagle, a lion and a shark blending together. Andy Airfix, is he not the guy who made those plastic aeroplane part kits? Aeroplane kits? Yeah. If it's his real name. Fact. Love Bites, the band's first and only number one on the US Hot 100, began its life as a country track. Not the most surprising beginning for what would become a massive power ballad, although the layers of backing vocals, inspired by the R&B of the time, and guitars and keyboards the band added in the studio, made it unmistakably leopard. That was written by Matt. He did a bang-up job. Colin said in the mid-90s, around the time Lang was producing albums by his then-wife, Shania Twain. Fact. The album was a slow burner. It took a year to get to number one in the States. Fact. They were once Taylor Swift's favourite band. Mm, I'm not sure that's a ringing endorsement. You're a 50s Came- Swifty, are you? I, I, I'll admit it. Fact. Phil Collin claims Florida lap dancers used Pour Some Sugar On Me, which led to increased radio airplay in the States and it eventually becoming a massive hit. There was like bopping the baps out to my guitar strokes. Let's have a, a look back at the Friday Rock Show, the BBC Radio 1 Rock Show every Friday night between 10pm and midnight, hosted by Tommy Vance from 1979 until 1993, thereabouts. We may have a finish, do National Radio 1. My name is Tommy Vance and welcome to the Friday Rock Show from BBC Radio 1. Tommy Vance, the Friday Rock Show. Back in the UK, Radio 1. Def Leppard were played 33 times, including sessions and live recordings, up to the release of the first single Animal from Hysteria in 1987. And I'll let Joe Elliott, lead singer of Def Leppard, tell you what the Friday Rock Show meant to him. When New Wobbum happened, he would play us, Arn Maiden, and so many others. It was the only place you could hear young rock and metal bands on air. I remember Tommy made the cover of Sounds in 1981. They had the headline Metal Guru on it, and that summed him up. That was the way we all felt about him. It was a sign of his stature in our world. What other DJ made the cover of any other weekly UK magazines at the time? None! His show was massively important, he's never been replaced, and he never can be. That's what Joe Elliott said about Tommy Vance and his Friday Rock Show. Sometimes what we like to do on Nostalgia, if we're looking at a band that has featured heavily during the 1980s and probably has appeared on the Friday Rock Show plenty of times, is to listen back to when they were first heard on the Friday Rock Show, that their singles were played. So let's go back to the 22nd of June, 1979. That's when Def Leppard first appeared on the Friday Rock Show. Something totally different. If you've been listening to Andy Peebles this week, you've been hearing a lot of Def Leppard. Right now we've got a track from their new EP. It's called Get Your Rocks Off. That was not Tommy Vance, by the way. No. No. Tommy Vance would periodically fail to make his flight back from being on holiday somewhere in Spain. And that was Richard Skinner. And he would often have to come in and substitute for Tommy. The 19th of October, 1979. And before that, you heard the new single by Def Leppard. It's called Wasted and it's out on Vertigo. Wasted from the first album, On Through the Night, 1979. And then later in that month, on the 26th of October, 1979, they had a session. Seven minutes after ten, and here's the first track from our heavy new band section. This is Def Leppard and Rock Brigade. Prior to that, you heard the single that's coming out by Def Leppard. Actually, it's out at the moment. Just to let you know, Def Leppard are Joe Elliott on vocals, Pete Willis on guitar, Steve Clark on guitar, Rick Savage on bass, and Rick Allen on drums. And they're currently on tour with ACDC. Uh, you can get a ticket. That was Def Leppard and Good Morning Freedom. Nice set by them. So it was a nice set by them for their session in October 1979. Then the following year, on the 12th of September 1980, the Friday Rock Show played Def Leppard's Reading concert. Ladies and gentlemen, here are Def Leppard. And that was Def Leppard as they were on stage at the recent Reading Festival. The tracks you heard were Get Your Rocks Off, Lady Strange, Overture, Medicine Man, The Walls Came Tumbling Down, 
coupled with Satellite. The sound mix was by Dave Dade and the production was by Tony Wilson. So that was back in 1980. So all of those songs were from their first album, On Through the Night. And we moved then into 1981. And on the 21st of August, 1981, the first single from their High and Dry album. And before that, you heard the new single by Def Leppard. That title is Let It Go. (laughs) Mosh Dalgit with Taylor and Bernie. I love these guys. And then in 1982 on the 22nd of January. And now is the forthcoming single from Def Leppard. Before that, the forthcoming single by Def Leppard. Not sure when it's coming out. It's called Bringing On The Heartbreak. I know there's a load of Def Leppard freaks up at Dumfries Academy, Academy Street, Dumfries in Scotland. The Friday sexy. Rock Show. Mm, very sexy. They played that Bringing On The Heartbreak on the 22nd of January 1982. And then the next time they were played was on the 21st of January 1983, which was the first single from Almost their third exactly year album. Later. Exactly. Two really excellent singles that have just come on the market. That is Def Leppard there. It is called Photograph. It's their latest single. It's on Vertigo. They come of age. With the noble assistance of Robert John Mutt Langer, producer. Did he say Langer? He did, yeah. Tommy liked to call Mutt Lang, Mutt Langer. Is he saying Langer or lang Is that the correct pronunciation even? You'd have to go all the way to the Swiss Alps. <laughs> On the 5th of August 1983, the next single of Pyromania. The biggest selling act in the United States of America, biggest selling British act that is, they are Def Leppard. Their last album in the States, I believe, shipped something like three million copies. Over here it did what? 30,000 top whack, I would say. Anyway, that's their new single coming out shortly, I believe, on the Vertigo record label here in the United Kingdom. Def Leppard, Rock of Ages. Good single. I am definitely shipping Joe and the boys. Yeah, they were full of ship. The third single of Pyromania was Billy's Got a Gun. And that was broadcast on the Friday Rock Show on the 30th of September, 1983. Now, September the 30th, 1983 on the Friday Rock Show is a very auspicious day because Tommy states that all tonight's music selections are being played from compact disc, making it probably the first ever show on radio to do this. He says that if you're listening on medium wave, the sound won't be much different, but in stereo, it should be much more noticeably improved. That wasn't the laser getting stuck in the groove. That is how the CD version of that actually ends. It's out on Vertigo CD. The album is called Pyromania, Def Leppard, Billy's Got a Gun. How quaint with their brand new (laughs) CDs, eh? Uh, That's great historical context, though, making the move there on the radio from, from vinyl to CD. Yeah. Then we have a long hiatus from the 30th of September, 1983, until the 10th of July, 1987. You're listening to the British uh, Broadcasting Corporation, just in case you wonder what's going on. Next week's Friday Rock Show is a bit special. It's going to come from the studios of Radio Television Aaron, which is uh, RTE, in Dublin's fair city. And over there, I'll be talking to three of the guys out of Def Leppard. Now, Def Leppard have been off the scene for a long time, as any self-respecting rock and roller will know, through various bits of bad luck and, um, well... A lot of bad luck, but that has turned into, I think, good luck for the guy, you know. You know, I'm talking about the drummer who lost his arm in a car crash, Rick Allen, smashing guy. Anyway, I'll be talking to Rick and also uh, Sav and also Joe Elliott from the studios of uh, RTE in Dublin next week about their new album, which is called Hysteria. I've heard the album. It's taken three years to put together. It cost over a million pounds to put together. And it's 63 minutes long. It's the longest single album I think ever issued. Exclusively, next week, we will be playing tracks from that album. It is superb. We have the single. It's called Animal. Yes! On the same show, they played the B-side of Animal. That track is on the B-side of the single. It does not appear on the album. Def Leppard, the B-side of their current single. You just heard the B-side called Tear It Down. Before that, the A-side, which is Animal which is the A-side in this country, but it's not going to be the A-side in America initially. Def Leppard, back on the scene with a really superb album. I heard the album recently, listening uh, listen to it on headphones, all on my own, very loud, and it's great. I promise you, it really is. That band have come back with a vengeance. Def Leppard will be touring the United Kingdom in September. The album comes out at the end of this month, beginning of next. Single, I think, is out next week. Animal by Def Leppard. Brilliant! 
So on the 17th of July 1987, as Tommy had alluded to the week before, this was the interview that Tommy had in Dublin with the boys in Windmill Lane Studios talking about the new album. But why? I mean, why Dublin? Well, because they speak English. And sort of. You, sort of, yeah. And you, <laughs> you can, it's basically a little bit like being in England anyway, you know. Yeah. We drive on the same side of the road, which is a big plus point, you know. And Especially for your fish driving. Fish and chip, yeah, really. Plus uh, they've got more TV stations as well. Fish and chips, nine TV stations, yeah. you know. It's, it's good radio. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It's also nice a great rock well, tradition. And a, and a good bevy. Yeah, and a good bevy, oh, yeah, which is really. very important. Oh, yeah. And uh, we don't have to pay taxes either. But that's beside the point. We just love the Irish. They're great. <laughs> that was Tommy Vance of the Friday Rock Show. And they were all the Def Leppard appearances over the years. Well, not all of them, but th- the most important ones. You are listening to a very squeaky Joe Elliott this week. It's time for a little break. I'm off to put the kettle on again. <laughs> This is Moshtalja. Albums that we love. Albums that were very important to us when we were growing up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we return mm. with. Track by track! Track by track. Oh, excuse me, Adrian. I'm just going to have um, a couple of gummy bears. Um, I need some sugar to continue the show. Track number one, Women. This is an Elliot, Colin, Clark, Savage and Langer. <laughs> uh, Shall we just call him Langer? For our Irish listeners, you might be aware of what that epithet means. But this is an Elliot, Colin, Clark, Savage and Langer composition. It's a Savage As Langer are, competition. Oh, yeah, I say, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> As are all the tracks on Hysteria. Except Lang for the drummer, because uh, he was left-handed. After waiting four years for the follow-up to Pyromania, the fans expected something biblical. Like Genesis is the opening book of the Old Testament, fittingly, Women is the opening track of Hysteria, as it retells the story of the Garden of Eden and how God created men and then lots of pretty women. Gee, Dorothy, we ain't in the new wave of British heavy metal anymore. When I first heard this album, with its clean, sanitized sound, the young me put it down to Rick Allen's electronic drum kit. But in reality, it's mostly down to South African Robert John Mutt Lang's production. When the new wave of British heavy metal bands are mentioned, Def Leppard are merely an afterthought. And on Hysteria, you can see why, as the heavier rock of the band's debut album seems miles away. Does this bother the band? Joe Elliott himself was quoted by The Guardian as saying, Total bollocks that. We were never new wave. No, a part of it. So don't call us heavy metal. We always had one foot in pop. So do you reckon this lyric would work today or would it be seen as misogynistic? Well, actually, I had a bit of a misheard lyric in this. It says skin on skin. <laughs> Excuse me. Skin on skin. Let the sex begin. I give you hair, eyes, skin on skin, legs, thighs. And I thought they then said, what's that smell? What's that smell? Well, Women. here you go. I was today old when I learned this because I thought the same thing. <laughs> Tell me what they're saying. What's that spell? <laughs> <laughs> What's that smell is much better. Isn't it? They're getting the pheromones up the nostril. I did look up to see what people thought about Def Leppard today. And one of the comments I seen was that Def Leppard is both ableist, anti-hearing impaired, and anthropomorphic <laughs> dyslexic labelling. I'll say that again. Anthropomorphic dyslexic labelling. Disgusting. Women was the first single off the album released in the US. The video for Women features a boy who reads a comic book outside an abandoned warehouse titled Def Leppard and the Women of Doom. Do you remember that video? I actually don't. Their videos all kind of blend into one for me. They're all the same. They're kind of live. Perms and squirms. So how do you feel about women? I can't feel enough of them. (laughs) Okay, so let's move on to track number two on the Hysteria album, and this is Rocket. And this is where you start to realise you're listening to something truly special, perhaps a special pop album. The middle part on this is a stereo treat for the ears. The arrangement, the effects, vocal layering are all here, and it's a banging good rock song. A genie, genie, a killer queen, a dizzy, a lizard, a major tom, so come on, we just got to fly. 
The lyrics here is Satellite of Love reference the name of Lou Reed's 1972 song. It also features some audio from the Apollo 11 moon landing. And did you know it was the final single from Hysteria? I did know that. And got to number 15 in the UK Top 40, but the heady heights of number 5 here in Ireland. That double drum. Big pounding drums come in yep. and great searing guitars left and right. Lots of stereo panning. Crotch bendingly high notes. This is the moment. You're, you're like Tommy sitting there in his jocks all along with his headphones. Nice. To boot. Tony beside him, serving him tea and cake. Sadly, it only got to number 15 in the UK, but that was probably due to the fact that there were so many singles released off the album. So why would you waste your money? Well, just go out and buy the album. Track three, Adrian. Animal. Animal is a classic rock song and my proper introduction to Verleps, copyright smash hits in 1987. I remember quite vividly hearing this for the first time on the radio while visiting my grandmother's house in Glenealy Wicklow on the east coast of Ireland. Oh, it's another one of your grandmother stories. Great. Hang on. Just let me get comfortable. I had brought my trusty portable stereo tape deck and I hit record to capture a shiny new song from the Leps. As we mentioned earlier, the lyrics can get confused in our minds. And I always thought the lyrics were white lights over stony ground. Such a lust for life, the circus comes to town. This, in my mind, was very atmospheric and conjured up images of the circus people arriving in the middle of the night and preparing to erect the big top. What did you say it was, the first line? White lights. So it was you like torch lights. So I when imagined. he sings, white lights of stony <laughs> I thought it was a white lion. <laughs> <laughs> That's even better. Which, from the circus, I thought, holy shit, Sigmund and Roy have lost one of their lads. <laughs> and he's escaped and he's gone out to maul a child. <laughs> and I thought Joe was some circus ringmaster who was going yeah. out to try to find the white lion who was running over stony ground. That sort of sprang up in my head. But we were both wrong. Yeah, I think white lights would have been a better lyric. Or white lion. You'd have I'd go with white lion. <laughs> white lion is a bit more extreme. <laughs> Mine is a, is a lovely romantic image of the pitch darkness suddenly illuminated by torchlights as the guys arrived in town looking for somewhere on this stony ground to pitch their big top. What was the real lyric in the end? It was quite bland, really. Um, yes, but it was white lightning. It wasn't. Which you don't know. It wasn't. It might have been an energy drink getting spilled. It wasn't white ground. lightning. It's a wild ride. Where are you getting your lyrics from? Uh, the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Like you get your medical diagnosis. Oh, no, you, you see, exactly. that's the whole problem. Is, is any of these websites right? Maybe I was right. Maybe I'm right uh, too. No, it's not, definitely not White Lion. Not a fucking hope. Don't they have the lyrics inside <laughs> the cassette sleeve? Better be two seconds there Get now. your cassette out. As Adrian runs to the dust-covered box that holds the cassettes of his youth to pull out gently the inner sheathing and to read no, the lyrics. No, they didn't include the lyrics. They didn't the include the lyrics, the fuckers. No. Animal lyrics. They all say a wild ride. There's none of them that say it was white anything. That's just stuck in your head. <laughs> I definitely seen it. No, I didn't. Nah. I did. I find the website. You yeah, know what website it was? Misheardlyrics.com. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they do say a wild ride. Oh, that's nice. I'm, happy I'm not going to gonna trust your wrong. facts ever again. I stand corrected. The wild ride. Great vocals here from Joe and a lovely layered mid-tempo rocker with a great chorus. Those lyrics, I believe, are truly unique. A lot of stuff about circuses and being an animal and stuff. They're so, truly unique not, to the listener, it seems. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what it's all really about, but it sounds great. Animal began its life back in early 1984, but it took multiple producers, including Jim Steinman, and nearly three years before it was finally finished and ready for hysteria. It was the last song demo by Rick Allen when he had two arms, and it was also the first single released in the majority of places from the Hysteria album and reached number six on the UK singles chart. Classic song, one of my favourites. Still love it today. I'm running with the wind, a shadow in the dust. I'm like the driving rain. One of the great melodic lines of the whole album when Joe sings that line. And uh, the restless rust, I never sleep. And I don't ever remember thinking that he sang the restless rust. I can't remember what he thought he sang. He just sounded like... <laughs> like a nondescript issuing of vowels and consonants from his mouth. Interesting. Like it were up in the field. Okay, so moving on to track four, Love Bites. I feel a great song is a song which can be broken down to the bare bones and played with just a singer and an acoustic guitar and still evoke an emotional response. 
Love Bites wouldn't be a great song at the acoustic bare bones, but it's a great song on Hysteria. I suppose with the Mutlang Sheen and the atmospheric synths, this becomes a classic 80s rock ballad and quite reminiscent of 10cc's I'm Not In Love, a track which pioneered the multi-track backing vocals. This is a song I'd associate with the U Club disco as you're trembling nervously and approaching the girl you fancy. Love Bites actually started life as a country ballad. It was a number one hit in the US on the Billboard chart and it is Def Leppard's only US number one. At the time, they actually held both the singles and album number one spot at once. Do you tell lies and say that it is forever? Do you think twice or just touch and see, touch and see, scratch and sniff? <laughs> Track five. After the love bites you, yeah, then you have to me. pour some sugar on her. They've gone from the love to the... Riding. Uh, yeah, that's it. Bailer on. Their biggest song. Yep. And the song that sent Hysteria Stratospheric. A gold certified rock classic, it's still played on the radio today. Critics, harsher than myself, would have a field day ripping this to bits. But we were doing this album for a nostalgia because we love it and we're not ashamed to say so. Although the idea of Joe Elliott being hot, sticky and sweet from his head to his feet does make me gag a little. <laughs> yes indeed. Not since John Lennon invited us all to come together all over him has there been such a celebration of splashing the juice all over someone's hopefully consenting flesh. Well, we did pour some sugar on me. Oh, well, this is a quote. <laughs> <laughs> well, you do lie in the bedroom with the missus. You say, I'll take out the catalogue for tonight's sexual erotica and I'll do the pour some sugar on me one. <laughs> <laughs> when we had done pour some sugar on me, we only did it because there was Aerosmith and Run DMC had already bloody done walk this way, you know. Love is like a bomb, baby, come and get it on. Living like a lover with a red eye phone. Looking like a tramp, like a video vamp. Demolition woman, can I be your man, your man? And did you notice Joe Elliott did some Nostradamus style predicting in that song when he mentioned the red iPhone? <laughs> yes. Really? You and your misheard lyrics, would you stop even thinking you know what the <laughs> lyrics are? I sang it to you, living like a lover with a radar phone. A radar phone! You listen to yourself back, you said red iPhone. But that's the Sheffield accent! <laughs> with a red eye phone! Down car phone warehouse! Comedy, where's the guitar interlude? <laughs> Pour Some Sugar On Me was a number two hit in the US and reached number 18 in the UK. And did you know Mount Merion House in Stillorgan, Dublin was the house being smashed by a wrecking ball in the European version of the video? If they'd known in advance that this would have been made famous by Floridian strip clubs, that they should have had a strip club video. But I suppose exactly. Mot Motley Crue might have done that. Track six, Armageddon It. Oh! Such a clever play on words. To be honest, the 14 year old me didn't get it. I just liked it because I thought it was about blowing shit up. There's some brilliant riffage on here though. I absolutely love the euphoric guitar solo. It would definitely be something you would need to take from a higher plane. It hit number three in the US and number 20 in the UK. Back home. Armageddon It. Armageddon It. Brilliant. Yeah. What more can you read into these rock songs? They're just good or they're not good. You like to tap your head to it or, you know, sit there with your arm around the girlfriend or swing in a can of Dutch gold with your mates in the park. Track it, Adrian, track it! Track seven, Gods of War. Now, there's an interesting juxtaposition between Armageddon It and the next track, Gods of War. Its menacing bass line is basically saying, enough talk about sex. It's now time to get heavy and talk about war. <laughs> oh, Adrian, you write so well. Well, there ain't got to be heroes. There ain't got to be anything. Good for more crunching riffs and Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher soundbites. War plane noises and some explosions. Ronnie is chasing those terrorists back to their foxholes. And Maggie's talking about the special relationship between the UK and the US. And sure, what better way to flog some records in the US from a UK band. Sadly, that's what really dates the song, which could be just as relevant right now. A cracking chorus and harmonies on here. The first time I heard of Gods of War was when my granddad Mason would regularly exclaim excitedly, By the Gods of War. It actually sounded like, Be the God of War. <laughs> and this track always makes me think of that. Thinking of you, granddad. Oh, this is where I come in and talk about the Nazis. Ah. Well, it's your grandfather. <laughs> Glad they went up the mountain. <laughs> Wasn't well, there that story about your grandfather as a young lad during the Second World War? Or the emergency, as the neutral Irish state put it. He was working late shifts, putting in the last of those wire fences up in the Wicklow Mountains for a farmer. Next day in the pub with the two friends, report on the radio said a German Luftwaffe plane was believed to have crashed, got lost and came down in the mountains after a UK bombing raid. 
One of the lads asked your grandfather, did he see it? He said he didn't. The other said he heard that the Heathland lit up in a massive flash. He had to have seen it. Was he drunk? Your grandfather said no, took off his overcoat and said, My round lads, do you like me new leather jacket? And there's an eagle holding a hacking kreutz on the lapel staring back at them, with a pistol popping out of the front pocket. Oh yeah, that was him. Of course it was. <laughs> your grandfather was some man. Maybe that Luftwaffe pilot is still buried at the top of the Wicklow Mountains by your grandfather. Track by track! Track 8. Don't shoot shotgun. Don't shoot shotgun has a big melodic catchy chorus that Kiss will be proud of. What's it about? Doesn't matter. Undercover. She's so shameless. You got me biting my lip. Possibly something similar to what Frankie goes to Hollywood we're talking about on Relax. Not shooting the shotgun! Oh. Track 9. Oh, is that all we're saying about Don't Shoot Shotgun? <laughs> just because, just because it wasn't a single, you're just brushing it aside like the fucking Brussels sprouts at your Christmas dinner. <laughs> it's a lovely analogy. Don't Shoot Shotgun is not a Brussels sprout song. What is it you like about Don't Shoot Shotgun? I love it. I just love the way it starts with Joe Elliott's pitched, ball clenchingly high, going... Da, 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 da. <laughs> and then going all the way back down... Don't Shoot Shotgun! Don't, don't, Actually, it's one of the dumbest songs on the whole album. And that's, and that's why I like it. Lot. It's Dan, yeah. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it dumber than Pour Some Sugar On Me? It is, because it wasn't as famous. And that then makes it really dumb. Dumber. <laughs> <laughs> great logic. It is. It's a great rock song. Let's select some lyrics and analyze. Hit and miss, like flesh and blood. She's sweet and indiscreet. She can't get enough. A little midnight madness, oh baby, you can't hide. So wild and unpredictable, step aside, because you're, you're shooting wide. Now, what's step happening aside. here? There's a Dublin influences there. So that's where they were staying as tax exiles in Step Aside. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, it's a little bit of filler compared to all the other hit singles on the album, but I like it. Track number nine, Run Riot. It's young, uplifting and rebellious. An anthony scarf waver that could send you running down the local farmer's field at 3.30 in the morning with reckless abandon. <laughs> Not a stitch on you. No. I wouldn't imagine Joe Elliott will be able to sing that these days. You see, I, I don't think Joe actually sings on this album much. Probably not. It's probably all Mutt Langer. It's probably all Mutt Langer, yeah. Mutt coded all of his vowels and consonants into a Fairlight and then just triggered them on his keyboard and then created Joe inside the box. I well imagine it. I, here's Joe. Run for cover. She's <laughs> so dangerous. And then Mutt puts him low down in the mix and layers 20 versions of his own angelic voice over the top of Joe. And suddenly it's like one of the finest rock focus performances of all time. Exactly. Little do we know, it might as well be Millie Vanilli. Secrets! After the Gods of War, these two back-to-back high-octane rockers with inane lyrics and just nonsense start to finish, but it works. After two tracks on the album in quick succession that weren't released as singles, we finally come to another single. It's time to walk across that deserted lonely dance floor when the slow set comes on and go over to the girl that you had your eye on and try to grab her hand and drag her unwillingly back out into the centre stage as the blue, red and yellow bulbs shine down on you as Hysteria starts. Yeah, you're setting the scene, man. Hysteria is one of the seven singles. The fourth, in fact. When I think of this hit ballad... <laughs> oh, sorry. What you, <laughs> meant, what, what you meant to say was... When I think of the hit ballad from this album, I normally think of Love Bites. But upon this mature recollection of Hysteria, I believe Hysteria is on par, maybe slightly better than Love Bites. Yeah, because on this on this song, there's no vocoded nonsense happening. It's like General Grievous is coming to tell you he's going to <laughs> suck your knob at night. I gotta know tonight if you're alone tonight. Come dance with me for the slow set. I gotta know tonight if you're alone tonight. That line there is for the paranoid lads, geographically separated from the object of their affection. Rick Allen, in fact, came up with this song title. And the pre-chorus chords were recorded by Mutt Lang one note at a time. So this was an example of his slavish attention to detail and the recording process where he just took everything bit by bit. I'm surprised they didn't take him out the back of the studio and just beat the living crap out of him. It must have been frustrating. So many takes. Okay, now we're not going home tonight without doing it one more time. Sav, you grab him by the perm. I'll punch him in the penis. That was hysteria. <laughs> 
Track 11 on Hysteria. Is that it? I mean, I mean, I know, I know you need to get her in at home on time before the whistle blows, but is there not more that could be said about the title track of the whole album? It's such a magical Mysteria. You've you've listened to this recently. Would yep. you put it on a par with Love Bites? When you get a little bit older and lower of bag and heavier of jowl, Hysteria, the song, works much better. Yes. It gets one's blood marginally uh, warmer, I think. Mm. Yeah. Love bites. You don't want to have love bites when you're that old. You don't want to go around with a big hickey on your neck. Hickeys are disgusting. They are. What better than have a woman be slightly hysterical over you? Not bunny boiling, you know, cook your favourite children's toys. <laughs> <laughs> Cooking Me your... Thomas the Tank Engine is in the pot boiler, <laughs> fuck's sake. <laughs> so no. Yes. What? So Hysteria is the title track of the Hysteria album. No uh, shit. As a single, <laughs> it reached number 26 on the UK singles chart and it reached number 10 on the US Billboard Hot 100, one of the many top 10s from Hysteria. Track it, Adrian, track it. Track 11. Excitable is next. And the heavy breathing noises were the source of many sound effects for our young attempts at recording audio sex comedies. <laughs> Yes, well remembered. It speeds up to a screaming crescendo, which gives away to the opening riff of this fun bop along. It's a bop along. That's a good way to describe it. Yeah, it is. It's a bop along song. Ballistic lipstick, dream machine. You got your leather lace long and lean. I think he's talking about Rob Halford from Judas Priest again. Inch by inch, mile by mile. What I do, I do in style. Yeah, well, the most notable thing about that to me was the. <laughs> Track 12, Love and Affection. The final song is one of the three ballads and easily the weakest. But I reckon it could have been a huge hit for a band like Cinderella. And that's a testament to the strength of the material on Hysteria. Yes, Cinderella is my go-to for all the cast-offs from Bon Jovi and Def Leppard. They'd love it, sure. Okay, on one of our classic album reviews, we're going to have to review Cinderella Night songs. <laughs> No. <laughs> and on that show, I'll be saying, well, this would have made a good filler on Slippery When Wet. This would have made a good filler on Hysteria. <laughs> to sum it up, I love Hysteria. Every song has been burned into my early teenage hormonal mind. It was great going back to Hysteria, and the album will always have a place in my heart. The lyrics are absolute bargain basement pish. However, it's all been brought together by Mutt Lang, and I would proffer that Mutt Lang is the reason why this album is so successful. Without him, it will be a Cinderella album. Speaking of the lyrics there, there's a quote from Joe where he says, There are two types of lyric writer. There's Bob Dylan, whose answer, my friend, is blowing it wind. Then there's Mark Boland with his up cap diamond star halo. It means nout, but God, it sounds great. That's what I do. It's nursery rhymes for grown-ups. It has nout meaning, but that's all rock and roll is. It's just entertainment. And yep, it's totally tongue in cheek. And then there was Mutt Lang. A South African Phil Spector brought his wall of sound with space. He sang all over the album. The smooth backing vocals, those open spacey chords. Steve Clark brought the melodies and the swagger. Yeah, if it wasn't for these two guys in the band, Joe Elliott would be back in the 80s working, stocking shelves in Asda. And did you know, in the sleeve notes, the band promised never to make the fans wait that long between albums again. That was a lie. This is what Joe Elliott said back in 1983. He said, Hopefully Pyromania will be a heavy metal Sergeant Pepper. Who knows? It'll be tragic if our best album was our third and we ended up doing 17 LPs. Well, it's 12 so far, Joe. And still nothing has lived up to hysteria. No. So he thought Pyromania would be their Sergeant Pepper. Mm. They counted on Pyromania to be their best album. They counted wrong. One of my other recollections of Def Leppard and, and our young days was that I saw them live. And it was on Thursday, 18th of June, 1992 in the Point Theatre in Dublin. And the ticket, would you believe, was only £16.75. Now, at the time, I only had a spare 16 quid. So I had to make a choice between Def Leppard tickets or tickets for Nirvana, whose latest album I thought was mega. Obviously, I chose Def Leppard, as I was sure I would see Nirvana again. Kerrang quote. In Kerrang magazine, Kerrang magazine was Britain's number one rock magazine, and it came out first in 1981, and it's had about 2,000 issues. Up until Hysteria was released in August 1987, Def Leppard had 17 cover mentions across 150 issues from its launch in 81. And they were cover stars only four times over those six years. Did the UK ignore Def Leppard or were they jealous of their stateside success and ostracised them thereafter? Because as Tommy said on the Friday Rock Show earlier, Pyromania shifted 6 million in the US alone and about only 30,000 in the UK. 
56 pages of content mm. were generated in Kerrang! for Def Leppard over those six years. Let me read you. Pyromania, when Pyromania came out, it was reviewed in issue 35 in February 1983. So this was Def Leppard's third album, and it was reviewed by Malcolm Dome. And it's always worth listening to Malcolm Dome. As to the material, each cut has the rasping, shimmering hallmark of a master blaster etched right through it. The band haven't just put sound to tape, they've thought out each crochet and quaver, ensuring that the final product is set for maxi metal enervation. The claustrophobic pandemonium of stage fright, the clasping earthiness of rock till you drop, the concussive electricity of Die Hard the Hunter, not to mention the flame on harmonics of f f, -f fooling These are just songs, but the birth of a legend there's uh malcolm dome in no way hyperbolic the best thing about that is watching you perform malcolm dome as you twist and contort and jump around <laughs> r.i.p malcolm let's go forward then to august 1987 kerrang issue 153 and allison joy the more timid and reserved allison reviewing hysteria so was the wait worth it should you buy it come on is the Pope a Catholic? Hysteria is without a doubt the album to set the standards in both musical style and production for the remainder of the decade, says Alison, and she gave it 5Ks. K -k 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 Colossal! Also, she gave Napalm Death's Scum only 2Ks. Bit harsh. That's it for Kerrang! Marshed out with Taylor and Bernie. I like it. So the reason Hysteria was such a big deal, because in the run up to the release of the album, Def Leppard had been in the news. Unfortunately, they were in the news for the wrong reasons. There was an accident. It was a tragic accident. Well, almost tragic accident. Don't you think that all tragic accidents are tragic? <laughs> you can't say there was a fantastic accident. A spectacular accident. A spectacular accident. Was that when <laughs> yeah. you were born? Yeah. When you go out in a big ball of flame. A Darwin Award accident. They're the best ones. The perpetrator has removed themselves successfully from the gene pool, thus helping evolution. <laughs> well, our buddy Rick didn't remove himself from the gene pool. Despite his best efforts, he lost his left arm in a car accident. The Def Leppard tour history explains that Alan was driving in Sheffield, England with his girlfriend when he lost control of the vehicle while trying to overtake another car. Now, some reports state that he was drag racing. This happened on New Year's Eve 1984. He was wearing his seatbelt but it tore his arm off as he was thrown through the sunroof. I never knew that the surgeons were initially able to reattach his arm, but within weeks it had to be amputated when an infection set in. This was devastating news to the band, who were riding high on the wave of success which followed Pyromania. I'm having real difficulty saying success. Why Isn't it is interesting, that? yeah. I can't even say it. <laughs> Let alone experience it. <laughs> yeah, it's alien vocabulary for you. You do not understand the word success, let alone success. how to pronounce it, how to live it, how to enjoy it. Failure. There's it's a word you know. Easy. That's a Failure. familiar word. It's Failure. Rolls off the tongue. Lead singer Joe Elliott was devastated by the news because he assumed, naturally enough, that Alan's drumming career was over, as did Alan himself. But miraculously he began tapping a foam insert on his hospital bed with his feet while listening to music the hospital staff put this big piece of foam rubber at the foot of the bed to stop me from sliding down he told modern drummer in 1988 i could push myself against it to hold myself up as i sat there i eventually started tapping away on it thinking yeah that come in handy i was working ideas out with my feet i got my brother to bring down my stereo system and i started playing all my favorite albums again as i sort of tapped along to them do a few things were a bit difficult because it only played a single bass drum so i took a lot of concentration to get my feet working right. His friend Pete Harley built a custom electric drum kit for him and Alan dedicated himself to learning a whole new way of drumming. He eventually went back to live performances in 1986. After three gigs with a backup drummer just in case, Alan took over on his own. Alan's injury and his determination to relearn his instrument, despite the loss of the arm, delayed recording of Hysteria. Loud reports that lead singer Joe Elliott said that the band were terrified and had zero ideas for new songs. They struggled to write while touring, and they'd done nothing but tour until Alan's accident. Luckily, their longtime producer, Robert Mutt Lang, helped inspire them to begin producing material. But just as they were making some progress, Lang begged off from the project due to exhaustion. The poor love. And I think that's about it for today. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Moshtalgia, where we hope we successfully well done. brought across how great the album Hysteria by Def Leppard was. Join us again as we unearth another rock fossil. Excavate it. 
spit on it a little, wipe it down and hold it up to the sun for a cold, harsh appraisal a generation on. Let the sun shine down on the ferric oxide tape once more, as we live vicariously through past glories of feeling energetic. And that was Def Leppard Hysteria. Ta-ra! Ta-ra. Right, we'll go for a cup of tea. Put on kettle, I'm famished. Bizarre. Can you actually hear me? 